Hi, everybody. It's um, Saturday afternoon, and I had said that we would have a meeting about uh, shopping and luggage. Uh, many of you have traveled more than I have. Maybe you've had more overseas miles and more trips than I've had, and I don't mean to come across as an expert. I'm just trying to answer some questions and help and prepare you for uh, what's going to happen is all. Uh, now, to let you know, I do have um, some handout sheets that I will immediately, when we get through with this, I'll, I'll send them uh, to everybody via email. And uh, so if you want to make notes or, excuse me, it's the teacher and me, you know. But um, I have handouts to go along with the lecture. So if you want to go along and make notes alongside or something like that, they'll be available to you, okay? I'll also be an easy reference. Uh, to begin with, when we first arrive um, in the Holy Land, uh, the passport and the visa and blue cards, just to let you know, as we said before, when you get to Israel, they will not stamp your passport like other countries do because Arab countries would not accept your passport. And so to give you the freedom to continue traveling around the world, Israel has been gracious enough to put in these little cards uh, like this. They're about this size, just size of a, a uh, wallet photo, basically. And uh, they will put this inside your passport and you, they will have your picture on it and everything. And then when you leave, they'll retrieve it. So that way they can tell that people have come into the country and come out of the country, which is the purpose of a visa. Uh, they'll kind of look like this as Carol's uh, from 2018, uh, trip from 2018, the front and the back, uh, kind of showing what they look like. So don't worry about that. Because we will be going to Arab countries, we'll definitely want to do that. Now, some trips begin in Egypt, go to Jordan, and end up in Israel. Uh, so that there's not any problem with this. But still, if you want to go back on that same passport, you'd have to do this to, to get there involved, okay? All right, let's talk a little bit about luggage. Of course, we have two bags. You have the one that is checked, and you have the one that is carried on, okay? One large bag each for free. Now, some people say, oh, I'm not going to take that much luggage. Yeah, take a big bag. Take a large bag, even if you only quarter fill it with your stuff because you will have souvenirs and things to bring back. And uh, yes, we can ship our souvenirs back. And yes, that can be done. But uh, there's a lot of stuff you just want to throw in the suitcase and bring back with you. And if you've uh, kind of packed too small, you won't have that option. So, so bring a large airline size bag and we'll check that half empty and be fine. Now, you're welcome to bring second, third, fourth bags if you want to. You'll have to pay those fees at the airport when you check in. And we do know that Amman to Jordan is going to charge $150 a bag flat fee for any extra luggage. So if you're okay with that, I'm okay with that. It's, I'm not trying to run your trip, but I'm just warning you and preparing you that that's the way it is over there, okay? So uh, be, be prepared. Some of the things that you'll want to put in your check luggage, okay? We want to dress light. It's going to be summertime. It's going to be the beginning of summer there, just like it is here. Uh, June will probably have cool nights and hot days, depending on where we are. If we're in the mountains, it's going to be cooler. If we're down in the valleys, it's going to be hotter and we'll be all over. So in one day, we can go from incredibly cool to incredibly hot, just from the top of a mountain to the bottom of the valley. Um, it's, you know, it's a 20 minute drive, but you're changing five time or climate zones by the time you get there. So you might want to wear stuff that's easy to layer and take off, layer and take off. Our bus will be very much like a safe deposit box. The, the large van that we'll be in will be very protected. The driver will stay with it. It'll be locked up. Our stuff is safe. So if you want to leave, uh, you know, take off clothes and put on clothes during the day, that's okay. That's, that's part of the tour. Um, usually light tops like polo shirts, t-shirts, whether you choose long or short sleeve is totally up to you. I mean, desert people wear long sleeve all the time to protect them from the sun. And uh, if they're not tight fitting, like caftans and things like that are, then the air flows and it's quite comfortable. So you do what's comfortable for you. Okay. Now do remember, we'll talk about this in a minute when we talk about touring luggage and stuff like that. But uh, Muslim and some Catholic holy sites will require appropriate coverage which means elbows aren't seen and knees aren't seen on ladies. Um, so be aware of that. If you, can, if you can take very lightweight pants and slacks, you'll never be in a problem. You'll be fine. 
Um, a lot of our women will just carry a scarf and wrap themselves around a scarf, their arms and their elbows aren't showing that way. Um, I've had some people wrap it around their shorts. They take a scarf and wrap it around their waist. And when they go out someplace, it looks like they've got a wraparound skirt on. That's fine. It's fine. Just be aware that uh, probably where we're going, there's only going to be a half a dozen at the most places where that would be required. And uh, because most places have tourist zones are kind of like they don't apply zones, you know. Uh, the Temple Mount will be one where they'll be very strict because it's a mosque and they want to uh, intimidate on purpose. They'll try and intimidate. But if you don't give them anything to intimidate, they don't pay any attention to you. So it's just pass by. Um, jeans and khakis are very appropriate. I mean, they're, if you're comfortable in that, that's fine. Don't feel like you have to wear any nice slacks or dress clothes. We are going to be in dirty, dusty, hiking, walking areas. And um, it's very appropriate. Some people want to take sweatpants, maybe to lay around around the hotel at night. You know, uh, if you want to wear them during the day, they're going to be a little hot probably in a lot of places unless you get real light sweatpants. But uh, remember, you're going to be spending some hours recuperating at night when we're through. And uh, you might want to have, uh, you know, some casual lounging outfits to, to wear. Um, let's see if we can get this to go forward. Gym clothes and sneakers, if you're going to do some exercising, workout, if you're joggers or something like that, almost all the hotels have workout rooms. Uh, Israelis are very, very, very serious about physical fitness and stuff, and they're very gym and jogging and workout oriented. You'll see it in most hotels. There will be places for that. And so, uh, and most places, and the places will be able to be safe to jog in the morning and, uh, or in the evening, uh, they'll be fine. You'll be okay. Uh, I wouldn't go any place, like any town in the world. I wouldn't go any place alone. I would do it in couples or pairs and find a partner to do it with. Uh, but I would say that about Oklahoma City and Tulsa too. So um, just just common sense in those areas. For your for your touring shoes, have a good, comfortable, broken in pair of shoes. Don't buy a pair before you go. And break them in there because it, you don't want blisters on the trip if you don't have to. Make sure they're about 60 to 90 days broken in before you take off in them. Uh, some people wear sneakers. Some people like walking shoes. Some people like uh, short little uh, short boots. Uh, again, I can't tell you what's comfortable for you, but you're going to be wearing them all day long every day for two weeks. And so be comfortable in them and make sure that they're, they're good for you. Um, uh, one of the more popular shoes over there is the Merrell, M-E-R-R-E-L-L, -L, which is a really good walking shoe. But again, I, I wouldn't say that's the only good walking shoe, but you'll see a lot of Israelis wearing Merrells and stuff like that over there. Um, and so it's a, it's a good shoe for about 100 bucks at Academy or something like that. I'm sure they're better. And I'm sure there are some that are more comfortable for you. But um, count on one pair, one pair to go. If you wear pajamas, by all means, throw those into your check-on bags and stuff. You're not going to need them on the airplane. Swimsuit, uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, go to the Dead Sea and swim. We'll have an opportunity, uh, hopefully, in the Mediterranean. If we have enough time, we'll spend a, an hour or so there, just kind of splash around the Mediterranean. Uh, the Sea of Galilee will be four nights, uh, three, four nights on the Sea of Galilee. And our hotel is right on the water and has a private swimming beach. The Sea of Galilee is the recreational lake for all of Israel because uh, they either go to the Mediterranean or they go to the Sea of Galilee. Uh, we'll find more traditional Orthodox Jews at the Sea of Galilee than at the Mediterranean because they don't really like mixed bathing. Uh, they don't like men and women on the same beach. And Tel Aviv, uh, the beach in Tel Aviv in the Mediterranean is just like any Mediterranean place. You'll see bikinis, you'll see really really skimpy clothing and stuff on men and women uh, who are getting <clears throat> sun at the Mediterranean there in Tel Aviv. So it's very metropolitan, very worldly, very uh, cosmopolitan. And you'll see uh, um, swimsuits that are appropriate there. But take a swimsuit in case you want to get wet. You want to get cooled off during the, uh, after a night. Most all of our hotels have, have pools. So avail yourself of that. Um, you want to get uh, some type of a sun hat. Uh, you know, something to keep the sun off your face and neck, perhaps flip-flops, sandals, 
I don't recommend those for touring, but when you're, you know, flopping around, you want to put on your hiking boots to go down to the pool or something like that, you might want to do that. Now, later on, we're going to talk about water shoes. Well, your water shoes will probably 90% of the time takes place of flip-flops or sandals. You can slip those on or walk around the hotel. Uh, if you're going down to the lobby to grab something to snack on or something, or if you want to just take a walk around the properties in the gardens or around the pool area, your water shoes should double for that very purpose, okay? Uh, I do say take more changes of underwear and socks than you do shirts and pants. Most people are quite, quite well fixed for about three or four pairs of pants and shirts. That's it. About three or four shirts, three or four pants, and they uh, will wear one for three four days <clears throat> because they're just not going to get like filthy dirty. They're going to get um, sandy dirty and dusty dirty, but uh, they won't get like work dirty. But uh, your underwear and socks will take a toll. As I said before, most of our hotels have uh, laundry facilities. Many of them, I don't know which ones exactly will because some of these I've not stayed in before. Most of them will have laundry facilities where if you're willing to pay to do the laundry and buy the soap, then you can do that. But all of them offer usually overnight laundry service and they'll launder it and they'll deliver it the next day wrapped and uh, folded up just like a laundry service. <clears throat> it's usually pretty reasonable. I mean, um, I wouldn't want to live with that kind of a cost in my life, but uh, but it's usually not exorbitant and it's not a ripoff usually uh, when you're traveling overseas. It's, it's reasonable, you know, buck a shirt, something like that. And if you're going to spend $20, $30 on laundry the whole trip you're gone, that's, that's usually not too bad of a situation. Um, but just be prepared for it. Be prepared. Now let's talk about the carry-on luggage. Okay, our carry-on luggage. Everybody gets one carry-on. Uh, a roller bag is usually really helpful because you are going to be hauling it. And when you, we do have the stop in Frankfurt and uh, we'll be out and rather than lugging the bag and rolling the bag, will probably be helpful, okay? In your carry-on, you want to, of course, have your passport. You'll have to have your passport. You can be asked for your passport anytime, any place in international travel. So you don't want it in your checked baggage. Also, your credit cards and cash for the same reason. You'll need to have access to them. And uh, you don't want your luggage to get misplaced for a week and you don't have any cash or credit cards with you. All of your health and travel insurance documents should be on you. They should be with you. Should you have an accident, should there be something that happens at an airport or something, you sprain your ankle, then everything is available to you right then. Now, many overseas, first times overseas travelers don't understand the next thing. And that is you should have a color photocopy of your driver's license, both sides, your passport, front page, and your credit card, both sides. Now you think, man, I'm, I'm going to make a copy of it and carry it with me. What if I lose the copy? Well, the secret is hide it somewhere. Hide it in your carry-on luggage. You know, put it underneath a bunch of stuff where only you know that it's there and then take care of your carry-on. But if your wallet or driver's license or passport are stolen and you have photocopies of them, everything can be taken care of. I mean, if you lose your credit card, let's say you lose your credit card somewhere, it's, uh, it's left, it's uh, stolen or whatever. What number do you call to get that stopped? What's the 800 number? Um, and when they ask you what's the credit card number and what's the CCV number on the back and what's the date? Um, I mean, if you want to type all that stuff out and carry it with you, it's really no safer than doing a photocopy. And the photocopy sometimes shows proof that you had that. And like a, uh, an overseas embassy might want to see a photo proof of your driver's license. And if international travel doesn't know that they need that, then they can be days delayed getting replacements. So it sounds weird, but it is a standard practice in overseas travels to make a photocopy. I know someone who bought on Amazon for a couple bucks, one of those fake deodorant cans or a fake, you know, potato chip can that has a false bottom and they put their photocopy in it, something that somebody would not want to steal. Um, I've never gone to that extreme. You know, I just usually fold it up and put in a pair of underwear or something like that and in my carry-on bag. Um, so something to think about, but it is, it is a good, safe thing to do. Um, I have, in 10 visits to Israel, been pickpocketed once. 
And it was more my fault than theirs. I was distracted. I was not paying attention. But I had photocopies of everything. And everything got immediately stopped. And everything got immediately taken care of. And in uh, about 48 hours, I had a brand new credit card. And everything had been shipped from the States to me. And we were fine. Uh, one time in 10. It, it can happen, though. It, it will happen. Uh, to people overseas because they do work tourist places. But we'll talk about that security and stuff later on, okay? Um, that's why I kind of like pants with front pockets that snap, something like that, because I can put the things that I really want to treasure or make sure take care of in there. But we'll talk about that with travel luggage and stuff. The next thing is prescription medications. Uh, of course, you want those in your carry-on. If, you, uh, if we get to Europe, and there's horrible weather over the Mediterranean, no flights are playing or flying for a while, and you were expecting to get to Israel and take your medicines because that's the way the schedule worked, don't count on the schedule with overseas travel. I mean, it, it, 90% of the time is always smooth, but you don't want to be that 10% where your pills are over there and you're over here. So uh, make sure that you've got them with you and take, take a couple of days' worth. Take a couple of days just in case something were to happen and you'll have them in your carry-on and you say, no problem, I'm covered. I got my medications and, and I'm not going to peel over because I don't have them. So it'll work out all right. Uh, you might want to take some snacks on your carry-on. Uh, they'll offer snacks on the plane and stuff, but if you don't like them or if they're too sweet or too salty and you have something that's healthy that you like, if, you know, they're like carbo-free keto paleo, whatever kind of diet, then uh, take your own snacks. It's okay. Put them in your cover, uh, carry on. If you got your mobile device, take a charger, take your camera on. You don't know, you know, what goofy things are going to happen on the plane. You might want to record or self pictures and stuff. Do that. Um, these little extra chargers that you can get that are like carry on batteries, you know, external, you can charge them up and then you can plug your device into them. And it's like having an extra big battery. If we're going to be on the plane for, you know, a half a day, basically, you know, 14 hours, um, your battery might run out and having a little backup charger helps. It helps. Uh, most airplanes have charging ports. Most airplanes charging ports don't always work that well. You know, I always get in the seat where you push it in and nothing happens. You know, you're going, I get the one seat that doesn't work. And so I have a little tiny square thing that looks like lipstick that I can plug things into. And it'll give me like five hours or six hours of extra charging time. So of running time. So you might think about something like that. Uh, don't invest a bunch for one trip overseas, but if you think you could use it otherwise, then do it. A change of clothing in your carry-on is good. You know, it gets a little sticky sometimes on an airplane. And I know that that's unattractive to think about, but it's true. Um, Books, magazines, reading glasses, sunglasses. Sure, carry those stuff with you. Um, if you want to take some wet wipes, hand sanitizers, it's kind of nice after a night to uh, go into the restroom and kind of take a little sponge bath or something like that or refresh your face. Um, remember, airplanes are dry. They're very dry. They over-oxygenate the air and um, your nasal sinus cavities and all that can get kind of dry. I want to take a package of tissues with you just in case you get the sneezies or something like that. As always, as always, we don't, can't take anything large and liquid in our carry-ons. The Americans are still way, way, way behind the rest of the world in bomb detection. We are light years behind the rest of the world. When, when you go to the United States, if you have a bottle of water, you can't take it through security. You know that if you fly at all, even if you're just flying to Tulsa from uh, Oklahoma City, can't take that liquid on there because it could be an explosive and that's not going to happen. And you're not going to take that. So you've just bought a bottle of water. You get three sips out of it and you have to throw it away. And then you have to buy new water on the other side of security so you can drink water. Um, Israel laughs at that. <laughs> you say, can I take this? Of course you can take the water through. We're not like the United States. We know what we're doing. I've literally had guards tell me that. We're not the United States. We know what we're doing. Of course, you could take your water in. And what, you know, you're passing through so many sensors that would set off the detectors if you had any kind of explosives in your water that it would have caught you at the front door. So you just didn't see them. You just didn't feel them. You didn't know it. They're just sniffers and everywhere. And so uh, you might want to 
you know, just get all of your liquids, shampoos or whatever that you might carry into small bottles and put them in a one gallon plastic zip bag. Cause that's what TSA is going to look at. They're going to look and see what's in that little one gallon bag. That's the same as traveling anywhere. That's not just Israel. Please, no tweezers, no nail files, no clippers, no scissors, no pocket knives, or any kind of sharp instruments in your carry-on. Now, of course, you can take clippers and scissors with you, but put them in your checked luggage so that you've got them when you get there. Uh, yeah, just a little common sense, because if you put anything in your carry-on, you will lose it. It will go in the bin, and you'll, you'll lose your favorite pair of scissors or whatever, pocket knife. Um, you can take it just not on the carry-on, okay? Let's talk a little bit about personal items then, about things uh, that might get a little more personal in a hotel and uh, on a trip. You must, you must have a water source. You must, now Camelback, if you don't know, is what bikers and people use that is like a backpack that's a water bladder with a straw that you can drink out of it. That's, if you like Camelbacks, you've got one, use it, use it but at least you need to have an insulated water bottle. Now this is, the brand is Contigo. We like them because they come with a little clip that you can hook to your backpack or to your belt. If you have a little carabiner clip, you can hook it with, and this will keep water, cold water, cold for most of the day. Um, we take a 24 ounce or you, they come in 36 ounce, whatever you want. Uh, make sure it has a good locking top so that you're not dripping water all over your pants or shirt while you're wearing it. But please do, 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 do take an insulated water bottle. Um, there will be places where we will be able to buy a bottle of water at every stop. There will be a lot of places where you can't buy bottled water at every stop. The water in Israel is incredibly safe. I mean, to get it right out of the water fountain where it's cold, great, no problem. Get out of the water faucet in your room, cold, it's safe. It's very, very safe. Uh, now, Egypt and Jordan, not so much. We're going to have to be a little more careful there. Bottled water will be the choice in both Jordan and Egypt. But in Israel, no problem. It's, it's very, very good water. Um, but we may not be near a water fountain if we're out traipsing around archaeological sites all day long. and may not be near a gas station or a quick shop. So have yourself a bottle of water and, uh, and take it with you. And some people will find that they're drinking a lot of water which is great. One of the biggest problems in a trip to the Holy Land anywhere in the Middle East is dehydration. People do not hydrate enough. They don't drink enough and they get sick from it. So we're going to be telling you, be sure to drink, be sure to drink. Every time you get on and off the bus, we're making sure you're hydrated. And, uh, and that's just smart. Okay. So anyway, the, um, these water bottles, some people take these and they'll take an extra bottle that they buy at the hotel or something, uh, or at a, quick shop nearby um, and carry it with them and then refill their water bottle later. Um, it's just smart to have, just smart and very good, and you'll find it necessary. Take some type of a backpack, small little backpack, doesn't have to be a big hiking backpack. You're not going to be gone from the bus for three and a half days in the wilderness, but something that you can keep your stuff in, you know, and get on and off the bus. A lot of people like travel vests or like fishing vests. A lot of pockets you can put stuff in it. Uh, some ladies use a day bag or what they call a cross body bag to keep their stuff in. And uh, you're not carrying all the things that you would carry in a normal purse because you're going out for the day and be back. And so uh, you can carry your stuff in those kind of a bags. The question of electricity is always a big issue. Converters, adapters, electrical appliances, stuff like that. What you want to do is you'll want to look on the charger of what you've bought. And on the charger, it should say, or it will say, you may not be hard to read it without a magnifying glass, but in the United States, we're at 110. Europe is on 220 to 240. Israel is almost all 230. You don't have to remember any of those numbers. All it has to do is say, this unit can be used anywhere between 100 and 240, and that makes it universal. It makes it worldwide. And more and more of these things are coming out of China. They're being made to be sold in every country in the world. And they don't want to make 13 different units. They're going to make one. And the one will work anywhere. Okay? So we everything that we have here in our home is we found is multiple voltage. It's just not a problem. So when you look and see if it's got it or not, 
all you really need is a plug adapter. The plug adapter allows you to just plug our flat stuff into their round stuff. They've got two round holes. The minute you do that, your appliance automatically adjusts to the voltage. It goes to 230 and it's fine. It works great. They, they are made to do that. So don't worry. Don't worry. That's what they're made to do. <clears throat> but if yours is not, if it says 110 to 150 or 110 to 200, that's not safe. It's not going to work. You will need a converter. And the converters are very small. You can see the size of the plug. They're not huge. Um, this is a great one. I don't know the brand. I just saw the picture and thought, well, that's pretty cool. So I didn't read the reviews. I'm not pushing this one. But, but what I like about it is not only do you have electricity, but you got USB uh, ports. And so you could be charging your phone or your camera or something while you're using your air dryer. Uh, that's kind of clever. That's pretty clever. You don't have to tie up one plug or buy a bunch of different adapters to fit all of your stuff. Most of your phones will do multiple vo voltage. Most of your cameras will do multiple voltage. They're made to do that. Um, but just to not tie up all your plugs with charging stuff, having one you can plug things into is kind of cool. Um, and all of these I just got off of Amazon just to show examples, okay? So if it's multiple voltage, all you need is an adapter. If it's not, then carry along a converter and the adaption is automatically built in. It's already got the flat to round for you. Okay. Uh, the third plug there uh, is like our third plug. Some plugs have it, some don't, but as long as you've got the uh, two pronged adapter, then it'll get power. We're not using heavy wood saws and stuff like that that would require a ground. So don't worry about it. Uh, this came in a two pack of white, two pack of black and, you know, that way, if you've got something in the bedroom and something in the bathroom, you're, you're in good shape. Device or camera? Extra memory card. Yes. Now, it's a lot different now than, ha than it was in the past. In the past, you had to carry memory cards or film because you had to get it back to the States. But now, uh, with uh, social media, with the Internet, with the cloud, with Facebook and, you know, uh, Twitter and everything else, you can get, if we have high wi-fi in the hotel then you'll be able to upload your pictures that night if you have the energy and time to do it uh you'll be able to post pictures on facebook to your family or to twitter or whatever your social media is um if your camera gets too full you have a cloud service that came automatically with your camera or whatever you can upload your pictures and then worry about them when you get home and empty your card and start over again there's a lot of different issues now that take care of some of these things it used to be issues when we travel but um, I'll let you work your own system out, okay? But you make sure that you've got uh, an extra card or that you've got access to the internet, uh, some way to do it. Because our hotels will, will almost all have Wi-Fi now. I, I cannot believe the changes that Israel made during COVID. They got on the stick. They used that downtime to increase their infrastructure immensely. I mean, there are sidewalks where there were no sidewalks before. There are signs explaining things where there were no signs before. There are coverings and archaeological sites are covered with pavilions now uh, that were never that way before. I mean, they really jumped on it and plugged into it. And uh, I'll be surprised at some of the changes I think that we'll see when we go back. But it's uh, they really, really used their time wisely when they did it. And a lot of that is the Wi-Fi. The Wi-Fi now is just used to be real spotty. And I understand now that it's pretty darn impressive. So the next thing is headlamps, the headlamp and batteries. Now, when we go to Hezekiah's Tunnel, Hezekiah's Tunnel is uh, a pre-Jesus by about 500, 600 years. It is a tunnel where ancient men actually worked through the rock together to let the Gihon Spring of Jerusalem flow into a pool. And uh, Hezekiah's Tunnel is one of the highlights of the trip for me because you walk through knee-deep water in a tunnel that was created in ancient times. And when the two sides met, they were only about nine inches off from each other. And it's amazing. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to walk through. It is a part of our trip. 
Now, some people who are a little claustrophobic or don't like to get wet that much or cold water up to your knees, because it is cool spring water coming out. Um, if you don't want to go through Hezekiah's tunnel, there is a dry tunnel that uh, is actually another waterway that no longer runs, and they can take you through the dry tunnel and meet our group at the other end. Or if you don't want to go through a tunnel at all, if you're just very claustrophobic and you don't want to do that at all, there is an outward sidewalk that will bring you out where we are. But if you choose to go through the tunnel, if you're going to go through the tunnel that Hezekiah's men built, um, you will need a headlamp. You'll need some kind of a headlight. And um, here I'm saying, don't go too crazy, okay? I mean, uh, some of us look at something like this and all of the men in the audience kind of go, <laughs> 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 We don't need that big of a headlight, okay? We don't need that much. Something very simple like this. Make sure that the band is very flexible, like a rubber band, so that you can wrap it up and put it in your pocket if you need to. You don't want something that's rigid and metal and gets on your head uh, like a crown. Just make sure that it's very pliable and very loose. And uh, uh, you're going to be in there with a thousand other people kind of training through, going through. And... Um, uh, there's going to be plenty of light with everybody that's in there with their headlights on and looking around and there's going to be more light than you would think. They just have not electrified it and they're not going to, they're going to keep it a mysterious fun experience with headlamps and just, just a few bucks of a headlamp is all that you really need to do. Okay. Um, easy on and off water shoes. Now, again, <clears throat> you might want to take your sneakers in the Mediterranean. You're okay with that, but Remember, in another 30 minutes, we're going to get out and walk, and you're going to go squish, 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 and pretty soon you're going to have blisters. So we do recommend that everybody carry a, a very small, lightweight pair of on and off water shoes. Put them on when you go through Hezekiah's Tunnel. Put them on when you go to the pool. Put them on when you go to the Sea of Galilee. Put them on when you uh, go to the Dead Sea, whenever we're around water and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm talking a very, very simple pair, like these mesh shoes here. Um, just something very lightweight and make sure they have a good rubber bottom so that you're not going to slip as all. We just don't want slip and slide accidents. But don't get anything that's going to take a lot of lacing up and a lot of work and a lot of weight. You're just not going to use them that often. Okay. But, uh, and these are practically disposable when you get back. You know, they're just very lightweight mesh. They dry out in no time. When you get to the next site, the soles may be a little wet, but you're not going to get a blister from wearing them or whatever. So really lightweight, slip on, easy on and off water shoes. And if you're a sunglass wearer, brought, you know, bring your sunglasses. Just be careful if uh, you have prescription glasses and you lose them on a trip or something like that. Uh, if you want to care, wear flip-ups or something, if you lose them, it ain't no big deal, then I'll leave that up to you. But it is going to be sunny. It is going to be bright. And because of the dirt composition in Israel, the dirt is a chalk. There's a lot of chalk. And the ch there are three kinds of chalk in Israel that are very interesting. One of them is a powder and is almost never can be reconstructed, can never be compacted back. No matter how much water you put with it, it just will never make into a dirt again once it's been uh, made into a dust. There's one that is very much like mud here that you can take it and make a mud ball out of it, and uh, it will turn into mud, and then you can crush it again. But there's one that's uh, Herod and uh, the emperors of Rome discovered that is how they actually make underwater um, cement. They use, they use this because it's a chalk, and when it's chipped away and made into a room and they spray it with water, it turns very hard. I mean, you can't crumble it again. It becomes very, very hard. And some of those caves that we'll go into and stuff that are well lit, they're not like caves that are dark, but they're well at caves and stuff will be rock hard walls, but it's just nothing but more than chalk that's been wetted. And so um, because of that, I say that the ground is very bright. It's a lot of reflection uh, around Israel and people go, is it brighter in Israel than anywhere else? Yeah. Yeah. Not, I mean, any place that's got that kind of chalk is going to be kind of bright. So uh, it's a little brighter than what your normal uh, sun is like in other places. Um, sunscreen. Yeah, you'll want to take a sunscreen. Again, it's going to be Jan June. We're going to be outside most of the time, be on and off the bus all day long. Uh, and then sunburn lotion in case you do get burned. It, now, there are 
pharmacies, there are drug stores, there are grocery stores, and all of the hotels have little sundry shops um, that you can go to. Um, but you'll pay a little more. You're in a touristy area. It's like going to Cancun or Miami Beach and being on the beach and going to a quick shop. You're going to pay a better price than if you just take a model with you and just shove it in your uh, check to luggage. I recommend that everybody take a travel journal. I don't care how good of a memory you are. You're going to come back. You're going to forget what day happened, what, where was first, what was second. Um, there's a lot that we're going to see. I mean, sometimes at the end of the day, you're going to think you've been in a marathon race because we had so much to see, but that's a part of the two week experience. And so if you've got a little journal and can say day one, we saw this, saw this, saw this. And every time you get up back on the bus, you just fill in and put in a personal note or two and say, I really like this, or I hadn't thought about that. Or, or Steve's Bible study said this, you know, um, there will be places where we'll have Bible studies. Some places we won't have time for Bible study. The guide will tell us the significance of it, and I won't say anything. But there are places where I'm going to uh, be sharing some Bible study and sig significance. But a travel journal and a couple of pens doesn't hurt. Just a little quart lock baggie, the plug baggie, pick it up, take your journal, write in it, put it back in, and to carry it with you everywhere. Another thing is a Bible app on your device. If we're going to read the Bible, if you want to study rather than taking your paper Bible with you, uh, if that's what you want to do, fine, fine. But uh, a lot of people just prefer to have a Bible app and get the kind that load into your phone so that you don't have to have internet. Because if we're out in the field, if we're in the Jezreel Valley looking at Nazareth on one hill and Cana of Galilee on another hill, uh, there's no internet down in the valley. It's farmland. Um, and uh, if you want to look up something, then you're not going to be able to because you can't get the connection. Uh, the one that we use in our church, I just, I'm not advertising. It's free to everybody, but it's literal word. It's New American Standard Bible, which is what I preach from. That's what I prefer to study with. Um, it is absolutely free, not a dime, not a cost, no hidden fees, literal word. It trans it does download to your uh, phone or tablet. It has word studies in it. You can tap a button and all the words will be underlined and you can punch them and get the definition of them in Greek or Hebrew, depending on which they're Old or New Testament. Uh, there's a cross-reference study that you can push a button for. It's a great little app. It's a good little app called Little Literal Word. But if you have one you like, don't add this one. Just get a Bible app if that's something you think you might want to do. Or be sure to take your Bible with you, okay? Hat with a brim. We've already said you need some kind of a travel hat. I would make sure that the brim is big enough, but not too big. Um, you, you want to be able to get in off the bus, don't you? But get some kind of a hat with a brim on it. Snack size baggies. Take a box of snack size baggies. You are going to find things every place you stop and go, oh, what a cool souvenir. I could pick up a rock here, or I could pick up something from this spot. But when you get home, how can you keep all those separate? You will find pottery. You will find pieces of pottery laying around the ground. Some of them will only be 500 years old. Some of them will be 2,000 and 2,500 years old. I'll tell you. You know, if you show me the pottery, I'll tell you what period it's from. That's kind of what my archaeological background is in, is in pottery identification. So I can help you with that a little bit. But how are you going to remember when you get home? If you take a snack size baggie and you get back to the bus and you pop the souvenir that you picked up for free and label the baggie with a Sharpie pen and say, you know, Jerusalem, uh, Old City, or Beth Sheehan, or Sea of Galilee, Chorazin, Capernaum. You can put the name of the town in it. You get when you go back home, you won't be lost looking at a pile of rocks going, what came from where? Trust me, this is a lifesaver for people that travel overseas. And I'm telling you, the ground is littered with free pottery. Um, back then, you, you didn't wash dishes. When, when dishes got dirty, you broke them and you went and got another clay pot. Also, if because the clay wasn't completely fired inside and outside back then, uh, sometimes the food and stuff permeated and they got rancid. And so you just break them. And so throughout the history of Israel, 
history of the world, there's broken pottery everywhere. Every time it rains, more pottery becomes exposed on the ground. Now, to archaeologists, it's trash. It's garbage. It's not collectible. If you do find a piece of pottery that has writing on it, or it has a stamp on it, or it has some kind of an inscribing on it, something dug into it or something like that, please, please show it to me immediately. Immediately. Because it is a federal offense in Israel to pocket that stuff. Because that could be identifying a, a personality in the Bible or a king or a pharaoh or an enemy who uh, an enemy king or something like that. It may be historically important. But if there's nothing written on it and there's nothing stamped on it and there's nothing painted on it, it's just a broken piece of pottery, you're free to take it. You're, you're, you're free. Uh, it's just picking up litter, basically. But to you and I, it means something. See, we don't, we don't walk around that all the time. To us, this is something that's 2,000 years old that I found at Bet Shean, at the city of Dan. You know, this is important. This, this relates to my Bible and my Bible study. So uh, having a box of baggies, those little Ziploc baggies, and being able to zip it up and write on it because it'll be covered in dust. And if you put it in your bag, your bag will be covered up with dust. So Ziploc baggies are important. Now, some people write right on the pottery with their Sharpie pen. They'll write right on it and say Jericho or Jerusalem or whatever. That's fine. I mean, you could do that. Um, archaeologists do that all the time. They write on the back side and then they display the front side. Um, but you still got to get, uh, you know, some kind of bag to keep the dust and the dirt away. And so I just like writing on the bag. And that keeps my piece clean and pure and all that stuff. So, so snack size baggies and some Sharpie pins, two or three Sharpie pins with really tight caps because you don't want them right all over your clothes and stuff. Uh, take those with you and uh, you'll be able to pick up souvenirs as we go. Um, one of the places that we'll be going down in the Kidron Valley uh, the water washes when it rains in Jerusalem and there's some pieces of pottery laying around that are 2,000 years old that are just, they're just this size. I mean, they're just about the size of a half a dollar or so, but it is 2,000 year old pottery and it's not costing you a penny to collect. So uh, if you have a Sunday school class of 10 people and you can take back 10 pieces of uh, pottery from the Holy Land, don't you think that would mean something to them? That'd be a blessing to them. Um with my kids and stuff like that at church one year, I brought back a sack of uh, seashells, shells from the Sea of Galilee, and found some beautiful, beautiful shells, and uh, picked up the, all the pretty ones, you know, and brought them back. And those kids just treasured that. And, and then later, um, their Sunday school teacher brought a little hand awl and drill, and they made and the girls made necklaces out of their shells and wear them and say, well, this is from the Holy Land. This is from the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it cost you nothing. It didn't cost you anything. It was a present and a real special prize for them. Women, again, as we said before, you'll want to take a shawl, at least a shawl or a scarf for the Catholic and Muslim areas, uh, unless you just wear long pants and long sleeves all the way. Um, there, I, there are very few places that require covered heads anymore. It's just not very touristy anymore. Uh, but the, sho the shoulders, elbows, and knees are the big things now. And then, of course, personal items you might want to take out for the day are snack bars and snacks along the way. And if you pack, you know, a, a bag of Sam's 40 different snacks that you want, take care of the couple, the pair of you, then you just take a couple of those with you during the day. And uh, as I kind of alluded to in our first meeting, we'll have wonderful breakfasts and wonderful suppers and Lunches you will need because we're exerting energy, but you know most people eat kind of a lighter lunch because they know such a huge supper is coming, a multiple course supper is coming. And uh, so taking some fruit from the breakfast and having a few energy bars or uh, Carol loves the uh, Ritz crackers with peanut butter and what Ritz crackers with cheese and stuff like that. And kind of bars. She likes little miniature Cayenne bars and because uh, uh, they're high energy bars. So you can get stuff like that and take with you. Uh, those would be personal items that you might want to, to have along the way. Okay. If you've got any questions on any of this, just write me, email me. What I'll do is I will gang email the questions and answers back out to everyone. I'll compile them 
I'll make a list and I'll send it back to everyone. And I'm reminding you now, you will be receiving an outline of all of this stuff. So don't be writing everything down that's on the slides, okay? I'm sending you a handout that's got all that so you can watch it. Um, let's get into shopping. Let's get into shopping now. Um, shopping, I've broken into the three different countries, shopping in Israel. I don't know much about Jordan. We're only going to be spending overnight in Jordan. So I don't think there's going to be a lot of shopping opportunities there anyway. It's not a very touristy kind of place. I mean, economically, Jordan is fighting for its own survival on a daily basis. So it's not really set for all of this. Uh, and then I've got a section on Egypt that we'll talk about. Okay. When we talk about shopping in Israel, I want to first talk about big ticket items. Israel is very prosperous. It is the high-tech center of the world. Everyone has left Silicon Valley, and everyone now centers in Israel and Tel Aviv. It is the second largest diamond and gemstone market on our planet, right behind Belgium. And where Belgium is the first and the most trafficked of diamonds, Israel is number two. And there is that stereotype in New York City of the Jewish diamond merchants, you know, with the hats and the girls and bags of diamonds. Um, I don't want to play into the stereotype, but let's say that they're very involved in the jewelry business, okay? So you will, if you want to, I don't do this automatically because people that don't go over there with a bunch of money don't want to spend the time at a diamond market. But diamond markets are, there's three or four that we will be very close to. And I've had people come here and say, Steve, I, I've got some money. I'd really like to invest in diamonds while I'm here. You can save at least 30% on gems in, in Israel over the United States price. I won't make any more guarantees than that. Some people have dickered and bargained and saved 50% on some serious, serious jewelry. Okay, jewels, loose jewels or jewelry. Uh, I will tell you that I saved and saved and bought a uh, ruby ring and an 18 karat gold setting in Israel, and I had it appraised when I came back to the United States, and it appraised for about 35% higher than what I paid for it here. Um, and that's an appraisal is sometimes lower than what the market value is. So I saved quite a bit from buying that same quality of ruby and setting here. Um, I only, only bought once. My dad bought a, a ring 35 years ago when they went with us, and uh, we found the same. He saved almost 50% off of the diamond that he bought in a, in a setting. There are people who will save up and take $10,000, $15,000 to Israel, invest it in diamonds, come back. They keep it underneath the legal limit. They come back and they sell those to local jewelers and uh, pay for the trip. I mean, it pays their $5,000 trip. Um, I, I don't do that. I wouldn't recommend that you do that. But if you're an entrepreneur and that's kind of people, you know, how you think, then Israel is certainly a place where you can do that. Um, it's, and if you're interested in going to a diamond market, it's basically just a, a high security behind closed walls, lots of guards, uh, lots of barbed wire jewelry store. It's not um, like a warehouse where you see people working on diamonds and stuff. It's a jewelry store but they are below market and you're trading and uh, no middlemen. You're not paying all the prices from the diamond marketer to the retailer. So that's, that is an opportunity you can do there. Now, Carol and I also have a friend in Jerusalem who deals in what we would call in the United States old pawn. You know that you could buy Indian jewelry, Native American jewelry at uh, pawn shops and buy hundred-year-old rings and hundred-year-old bracelets of turquoise and silver, and they're pawned by Native Americans who need the money, and you save money by buying pawn jewelry, which is old classic jewelry. We have a friend in the old city that trades in Persian and Bedouin pawn. He has some beautiful, beautiful things. And uh, if you are wanting to invest, now this is for investment, but if you're wanting to invest, like this is a Bedouin bracelet that Carol bought. It's filigree. There's actually air. If, let me see if I can hold this up where you can see my shirt. Can you see the red through that? 
But anyway, <clears throat> it's all hand work. This is probably a Bedouin wedding bracelet given as a gift, not to from the room, but from family members, from a uncle or a cousin or somebody like that. But this bracelet is about 250 to 300 years old, about 300 year old silver. And um, so we've had it, you know, everything we've ever bought, we've had checked in the States and we're being told the truth that this really is that old and it really is that classic and it really is that important of a piece. Um, this turquoise and Yemenite bracelet um, has coral in it, has red coral. I'm sorry, the sun's getting on us there, but it's got red coral and turquoise and very, very fine filigree work on it. Um, when your Carol said, I'm saving up for Christmas and birthday and I'm going to go buy some jewelry from, from Joseph. And she did. And she bought that, this pawn, Bedouin and Persian, Iran, Iraq, Syria, all those Bedouins from there. Now, that we can also buy modern type stuff there. This is a little more modern turquoise and silver piece. Um, let me see if I can get out of the sun where you can see a little better. Yeah, there you go. This is all hand silver work done by artisans that are been around for a long time. The first few pieces, $300 price range. Just, I don't mean to show my laundry list, but, but you know, three to $500, something like that. If you want to invest in something that's hundreds of years old, uh, the necklace was probably made during the civil war, during the American civil war uh, over there. Um, this one has no stones in it, but it's just silver work, beautiful filigreed silver work. Um, those bracelets you're probably looking at un well under a hundred dollars. Well under. Um, this is Yemenite. You'll hear a lot about Yemenite work there because it's cut out. You see the wires that are twisted and made to look solid, but yet they're see-through. It's absolutely see-through. Um, I have to close the curtain, stop and close the curtain. But anyway, I'm not trying to sell you on anything. I'm just trying to give you ideas of what's available. So that you don't go there and say, well, I wish I would have known. Okay, that's all. That's all I'm trying to do. We don't make a dime off of this stuff. We've had dealers. We've had stores try and offer us kickback. We do not accept it. We say, give them the discount. Whatever you're going to give us, give them. Um, now, all of our guides will get kickback, but that's just part of doing business there. That's a part of their, their business. As far as modern jewelry, this was a modern ring that Carol bought on one of our very last trips. Um, I'm going to put everything on pause and I'm going to go close the curtain. Okay. Uh, this is the ring that she bought recently. That's an opal. It's a beautiful opal. They do a lot of good opal work there. And it's got a little gold setting on a silver band, hammered silver band. So modern jewelry, old jewelry, but big ticket items, three, four hundred, five hundred dollar pieces. Yes, they are available. Yes, they do have them. And uh, yes, we can take you to places where those things are available. Um, <clears throat> ancient artifacts. Getting, um, now get off of click again. Um, this is a Hellenistic time of the Greeks, about 300 BC, oil lamp. The oil would go in here, the wick would go in here, you would light the wick, and then you would carry this as a personal lamp. But it is about... 2,600 years old, 2,400 years old, something like that. Um, something like that you're going to pay a couple hundred dollars for. This is a Roman glass vial. Now, I keep it under plastic here to keep it from getting too dirty or whatever. But that's ribbed glass that was made by hand and hand blown um, by Romans. This is the first century. This is the time of Christ, glass. Something like this costs you yeah, 300 bucks, something like that. Um, coins, ancient coins. This is a silver Roman coin. This is a coin of Marcus Aurelius, who was the emperor in the show Gladiator. Okay. And uh, this is the real deal. This is a legitimate museum grade piece that, uh, again, will be uh, three to $500. You can buy coins as low as $25, though. You can buy ancient coins uh, for a pittance, really, if you just want souvenir coins. Most Israeli coins are going to be quite dark. They're not going to, you're going to have to hold them under the light to see a lot of detail. Um, like this, you see how dark it is? That's because they're made out of bronze. 
and they're going to oxidize. Um, you can buy silver. Can you see the figurines on the back there? It's two men shaking hands. Um, you can buy silver and gold coins that are ancient. You certainly can, uh, but they're in the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars range. They're for the serious collector or investor. Um, most gold and silver that's found in the way of coins is melted down by the crusaders or the Muslims or whoever, because they didn't have, what could they do with an old coin? I mean, what could they do with a 300 year old coin? It certainly didn't have any value, but the only value was in the gold or the silver. So to find gold and silver coins is very, very rare nowadays because most of that stuff got melted down and used elsewhere. There are very, very expensive things and very inexpensive things that you can find. You can buy um, little pieces of pottery and stuff that are, you know, clay pots and stuff for uh, $100 or less. So it, they're out there. Um, and we'll be going to and giving you opportunities if that's something you want to do. We will help you do that. We're not going to force everybody into that. We're not going to take you like a little choo-choo train through the stores and make you do that. There'll be a couple of places where we'll stop at tourist shops that will offer you good prices for good stuff. And, um, and where I know that the guide's probably going to get a little money off the side and they're going to get some, some kickback. We're not going to take that, but, uh, but it is there for you. Okay. This is about one of our friends that we will go to. This is Zach's little shop of antiques and jewelry. This is a very interesting coin that has Paleo Hebrew on. This is a Hasmonean or a Maccabees, you know, 100 years BC, and has Hebrew. If the Jews were not here, you know, you should find Japanese. We are Palestinians. We grew up in Jerusalem. My business first is uh, biblical antiquities. You know, my vision is to have gifts that is connected to the Bible. We're respecting the law and working hard, and we're getting prosper in Jerusalem, like anywhere else. We saw that Israelis are trying, and you know, it made us like we want to support them, not to look on a, an identity, to look on human beings, and that they're made on the image of God. This is the oldest coin uh, I have. It's a uh, fourth century BC, Judah, you know, or, you know, Yahud. I don't know if the camera can see this, but next to this, next to the eagle here, it has three ancient Hebrew letters. It says Yahud, like Judah, Jews, like Jews were here under the fourth century BC. You know, people were like, one day we're our enemies, and we studied that they're our enemies. Then just like meeting them and understanding that they're trying very hard to not have a, another Holocaust. And they're doing their best to keep the law and give equality for their people. You know, it made us appreciate them more. Our hearts more were open and we saw that their hearts are open too. You know, to people in the land, even they were not Jews. You will not understand it if we don't understand that God is love. God did all of this as a reaction of his love. God keeps his covenant because he's a loving God. God, you know, take care of his people because he's a loving God. God sent his son to manifest his love because he is love. And the biblical archeology span proves the Bible. These items just open up the Bible. You know, you know, you see something and you can understand the verse in a better way. If my first identity is Christian, I understand that God has put borders and nations and times for every people. Okay, that's a dear friend of ours, Zach, Ms. Rocky. Uh, he has a very small shop. We'll be in some much bigger stores, but uh, he's honest, he's legal, uh, he's fair. Uh, and so those that want antiques or jewelry, uh, he takes a lot of old coins and makes them into necklaces or makes them into bracelets or rings. And so if you want to have a piece of jewelry that is an ancient piece, then we can put those together for you too. Now, another place that we go that's kind of selfish uh, is the Nao Shoe Factory. Um, this is an Israeli-made shoe. It's a high-fashion woman's shoe. Uh, if you go on the internet, you'll find the Nao spot, and they are... Um, much more popular in Europe than Birkenstocks are as far as uh, 
fashionable sandals. Um, they are highly coveted in South America and where people are very fashion conscious. If you go to a high-end shoe store here, they will have Naotes. Naotes are, are quite popular. And some of you ladies are already familiar with that. We will go to their factory where they have a showroom and they have a place where you can actually buy the shoes from the factory shop. And uh, you can save 40 to 50%. Now, they don't have every style and every size because they're shipping them out to make money. But if they have the current or last year's seasonal model and they've got a huge warehouse where they'll go look for your size, they have helpers there just like any other shoe store. And they're there to make a profit. But uh, you can save 50, 60% off of the American prices. And so many of our ladies will go and buy four and five pairs of Naotes to bring them back. Um, we'll not spend a great deal of time there. We'll spend about an hour there. Those who don't want to know shoes, I'll take you on a little walking tour around and show you what it's like to live in a village that 40 years ago was constantly, and I mean daily, being bombed by Lebanon and by Syria. There you... When you pull in the parking lot and park the bus, you get out and there are all these things that look like metal out or concrete outhouses. And those are the bomb shelters. Those are the bomb shelters. So we'll walk around and show you some of the security measures of what it's like to live near the border. Now, they're quite peaceful now and they're quite safe and they haven't any trouble in 40 years. But they still have all of the remnants of what it was like. And they live <clears throat> all the time in a what if war breaks out kind of mode. So the Nail Shoe Factory is, is a fun stop. And uh, if I didn't do that, Carol would probably, well, let's just say we probably wouldn't go to Israel as often. So they've gotten into boots and different types of fashion wear and Uggs and Ugg style things now. And uh, again, it's very high end, very nice. You can see the prices there. <clears throat> uh, 139, 221, 29, 200, 160, $200. Um, a nice shoe, nice high quality shoe, but uh, you will, you'll, you'll be eating those for about half price at the factory. Um, just regular jewelry. I mean, just normal jewelry, the necklaces in the shape of Israel, the nation of Israel, stars of David, menorahs, different kinds of things are made out of gold and silver. Malachite is a, is a very green stone that they have naturally there. Opals, lapis, turquoise, um, is very predominant there. A lot of people like to get their name in Hebrew, gold or silver. You can get different qualities of gold and different qualities of silver from very inexpensive to very expensive if you want to. In fact, there's one shop that even has all the letters made up and then just kind of welds them together, but they have diamonds in them. And, uh, and another store has cubic zirconia. If you don't want the diamond, but you want the look of the diamond. So that's kind of a fun little souvenir thing that a lot of people like to have their name written in Hebrew that way. Now, this is what Jerusalem stone looks like. Jerusalem stone is a, a very hard, very hard. It's a, almost like a marble, but not quite. It's in the marble family. It's very pink and yellow is the natural color of it. And a lot of the walking stones of the time of Christ were made out of Jerusalem stone because they polish nice and they uh, are very, very hard. One year, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I was in an archaeological site and working, and we found some uh, pieces of Jerusalem stone that had been uh, street uh, level, and they'd been streets, but they were all broken and busted up and not worth anything. So they were going to go to the junk pile uh, for us. We, we dated it. We did all the stuff we needed to do. And then after that, it wasn't worth much. But uh, this is a piece of Jerusalem stone that I just picked up. You can see that it's got broken edges on it, but it also has a shiny polished side to it. And that would have been the street side. And you can see the reds and the, or the pinks and the yellow in it. Um, so, you know, you'll, you'll see little pieces of that that are fist size and that's Jerusalem stone. And they do make some really pretty jewelry uh, out of Jerusalem stone. Okay, some smaller or regular ticket items. Let's just talk about souvenirs and stuff, okay, in Israel. Those are all hundreds of dollars worth of stuff. Let's talk about just souvenir type things. Silk scarves and shawls. Um, 
again, you're dealing with Israel. Israel is surrounded by Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Damascus, Syria, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq, all of these beautiful artisans. There were Jews in all of those lands, and they immigrated back to Israel and brought their craft with them. And many Arabs fled different types of persecutions and ended up there. So you will find beautiful, beautiful fabrics and beautiful different. Uh, this is a uh, this is about a ten dollar scarf um, that Carol picked up there, and it's a beautiful woven type of fabric, and has a little bit of a fleck of of shininess to it. It's got an iridescence, but then when you go down farther, you find this beautiful tapestry work, and this is just a huge, huge shawl out of some beautiful, beautiful colors with some shine and some gold in it. Uh, so it would be like a $10 souvenir for somebody if you want to do that. Uh, a good souvenir for yourself, you know, or a gift for a brother or a sister or something like that. Um, lots of the stuff like that. Lots of that will be around. And they don't have Made in China written on the side. Trust me, they, they are the legit thing. Um, we had one lady that is a seamstress who came home with, a couple thousand dollars worth of fabrics that she said, I, there's no way I could afford that stuff home. There's no way. She bought uh, silks from the Orient and she bought Persian uh, tapestries and stuff like that. Um, there is a tapestry store that sells antique things. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, the world's your oyster when you get there. Exotic blouses and dresses, just inexpensive tops and skirts and things like that that are really beautiful fabrics. Olive wood, of course, is a major, major market there. We will be in Bethlehem, and Bethlehem is only a very short drive away. If we have a, a free after, you know, if you get your free afternoon, you want to go to, back to Bethlehem, you can certainly do that. It's just an easy cab ride, uh, just a few miles away. Much closer than it looks like on a map, much, much closer. Um, but in olive wood, you will find all kinds of artisans now. Here is a very simple little souvenir type box that you'll find in every store. This is a mass produced, yes, it's not handmade, but it is made in Bethlehem and it has uh, engraved the Jerusalem cross, the four crosses of the, of the uh, crusader countries who ruled Jerusalem. Um, but it's olive wood on all sides, has a velvet bottom on it, a nonstick bottom, and inside is velvet lined. And you'll pay four to seven dollars for something like this in a souvenir shop. And uh, I have a short little film on one of the stores. Now, this is not one that I'm personally familiar with. Uh, I know the family name, but I don't know the, the store that they're talking about. But it's uh, how they would make um, an olive wood piece by hand. So uh, let, me, let me start that little clip, and I hope that you all enjoy it.
Okay, that's just one manufacturer, one family that works in Bethlehem in Olive Wood. And uh, uh, you saw some stuff was a little more primitive than others, some's a little more fancy than others. But uh, of course, Olive Wood is available to you. And uh, all over Jerusalem and all over Israel, you'll find it. Mother of Pearl, again, this is from some outside uh, sources. These are some of the Damascus and some of the Lebanese people that have done that. Uh, Mother of Pearl inlay, uh, they are experts at it. They are really uh, good at it. Um, an inexpensive little inlay box like this for a jewelry box or for a mom or grandmother or something like that is a nice little gift. Then there is Judaica. Judaica is things having to do with Israel, like menorahs. Um, there are two different kinds of menorahs. I think I just put myself in right in the place here. This is a seven stand candle stand, one in the center and three on each side. This is the typical seven day a week menorah uh, that a Jew would use in their home or for Sabbat for their uh, Sunday meal, Saturday meal, their Sabbath, um, and uh, is. Can come in all sizes, shapes, colors, and styles. Very modern, very stylized. Or you can buy a nine branch, which is indicative of Hanukkah around the Christmas season. Uh, it has nine because they found the uh, menorah and a jug of oil when they rebuilt the temple that had been destroyed, had laid there literally uh, for a hundred years, and they came back, restored the temple and found this jug of oil. Well, it should have been one day's oil, but it actually lit the menorah for nine days. So they talk about the miracle of Hanukkah, the multiplying of the oil. So a Hanukkah menorah has nine days in it. They'll, light, they'll have one lit, and then every day of the nine days, they will light a new one, and then Hanukkah is over. So you can buy either one or both, and uh, they have them there in all kinds of different styles. Mezuzahs are popular souvenirs. Every Jew will put a little metal or some type of a box next to their front door. And when they go in, they kiss it there with their hand in, and they'll lay on it. And they'll usually put their hand on it and pray for a moment. Inside there is a little tiny parchment scroll, a little scroll that has been written by only a certified rabbi. And it is a couple of verses from the Old Testament about blessing God and God blessing man, man blessing God and God blessing man uh, in, the, in the mezuzah. And uh, a lot of Americans like those to take home as a souvenir because they're small, they're inexpensive. They come in every kind of uh, fabric you can make from gold to silver to metals to steel. Um, Here's some samples of some that were just on the internet. There you go. Um, there's a ceramic one, there's stone, there's metal, plus an overlay. There's some uh, gold and silver with Noah's Ark on it. This looks like some kind of pottery or something with an inlay in it. Um, anyway, mezuzahs, very Jewish and very, uh, very inexpensive. Kipots and Talat, uh, this is the yarmulke, the hat. A lot of people like to pick up a yarmulke as a souvenir and bring one home as a souvenir to someone. My goodness, you will have more than your dream of choices of, of uh, kippahs or yarmulkes everywhere. Talits are the prayer shawls, and they're available everywhere. And if you want to bring back a prayer shawl and display it at your church on the communion table or something uh, during the holidays, uh, those are something that you can buy. And shofars are the big horns. These are animal horns that are used to blow, and uh, they were the early trumpets. Uh, of their day. And the Old Testament is full of the blowing of the shofar. Uh, they started every holiday with the shofar so that people knew when the Sabbath began and when the Sabbath ended. And uh, we will go into stores that will literally be bins, three foot high bins full of uh, shofars. And you pick the color, the size, and the style that you want. Those are more than uh, available there. There are a few exotic things, a few exotic things like leather. There are lots of people that have come from, again, other places in, in the Middle East who are excellent at leather goods. Maybe you want to get a leather briefcase or a, a bag or something like that. You'll see leather stores and uh, uh, be careful. Just look at them like you would anywhere else. Make sure that the seams are tight and they're not just glued and stuff like that. Because 
um, you know, they make uh, dime store versions and they make real store versions of everything. So, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll be looking at those things. Spices. If you want to bring home some spices, they will put them into a sealed bag and staple it. Then you don't open it again until you get to the States and it will clear customs just fine. You won't have any problem with bringing spices back. But as far as places you never dreamed of, I mean, cooking materials you've just never, ever dreamed of, mortars, pestles, grinders, and things, because they take their spices so seriously in the Middle East. And uh, you'll be able to buy saffrons and things like that for 25% the price you would here. I mean, saffron's incredibly expensive in the States. And there it's just, you know, it's just another spice. They know that's important. But uh, it's, it's not anything like it is here. Um, stores with just bins of fresh ground spices. That's it's all this. We're in the store looking out at the street. And people are there buying from this man. And this is what his store looks like from the back looking forward. This old boy is very famous. He's in the uh, Arab Quarter on the Via Della Rosa. And he makes this huge pile of multicolored spices. And then has a dome on the rock on the top. It's kind of a defiant statement that this is, he's an Arab Muslim and uh, has his sheikh or his father. I don't know which one that is, but someone that he may follow or revere, probably a, maybe a grandfather and his son. But anyway, see the piles of spices in the background? Just piles of them and nuts in the containers and uh, small containers of whatever spice you want. So bring those back. Armenian tiles and ceramics. Armenians, there's an Armenian quarter of Jerusalem, and it is the, uh, they were the first nation to convert as a nation to Christianity. So they have a lot of land in the Holy Land, and they own a lot of the spaces there. They're very poor. They can't do a lot with it. They're not very extravagant as, as a people. They're very, very poor. But their ceramic work is world famous. And they have shops and shops and shops of this very simplified, bright color ceramics that are Armenian ceramic tiles. And the stores, ceramic stores just are piled with dishes, cups, saucers of Israeli sayings and prayers and stuff like that. The Armenians are Christian. It's a Christian nation. Um, and so most of them are very Christian. Some other exotics that you can take advantage of are Dead Sea cosmetics. They sell for a lot of money here in the States, and you can get them there because you're at the Dead Sea. And all of the companies that collect that stuff and make it and refine it are right there. So it's, it's pretty dirt cheap over there to get Dead Sea cosmetics. And then oils, like uh, olive oils, because it is an olive oil producing country. You would be able to buy all kinds of olive oils and sometimes like flavored olive oil, like garlic infused and uh, hot pepper infused old olive oil and get very, very high quality. If we have time, now we're not going to force our way into this. Um, guides like to force us to go to some places because again, they get the kickback. Um, my guide and I know each other well enough that I'm not going to play that game and she's not going to try it on me. I will stop it. But if we have time, we will go to an olive oil factory. And we will watch uh, um, how olive oil is mass produced today and how it's kept pure and how it's uh, harvested. But more than anything, they want to get you into the tasting room where you can taste the different olive oils that are fresh from their factory and from their trees and from their harvest. And then, of course, there will be a shop at the end where you can buy said products. And uh, you don't feel pressured to buy anything. You can taste everything you want to. Thank him very much and just keep walking. But if you want to take a bottle of olive oil home from Israel, eh, it'll be available to you. The same thing is true with a wine shop. Carol and I do not drink at all. We don't imbibe, but we know that other Christians do. And uh, that's fine with us. But uh, the wineries of Israel, and especially the Galilee, are becoming world famous and award-winning wineries. And so if we have extra, extra time, we might make it available to, you know, if we've got another hour before we go back to the hotel, we may go to a winery and let you see how that's done. Um, but those are souvenirs that you can bring back too, okay? But they're kind of on the exotic side. They're not the normal stuff. Okay, let's talk about Egypt. We're about done. If you, Hopefully this, you know, because this is on tape, you can stop it and get it and walk around. I know I've been talking for a long time. 
Uh, I told you it'd be about an hour, hour and a half. So, you know, we're, we're okay there. But when we're talking about shopping in Egypt, brass and bronze is one of the things they're proudest of. Hammered brass and bronze plaques and tables and serving trays and even large tables like this. They will, they will ship these to the States for you. I mean, they will wrap them up beautifully and they will ship them. And you can buy beautiful pieces or buy small, you know, a, a handmade key ring or something like that out of Egyptian brass or bronze. This is one of the master artists and things that they have and that they do. Okay, let's move me again. Again, leather, they are masters at leather work. You will see more leather in Egypt than you will in Israel. A lot of the leather you see in Israel will be Egyptian who have migrated there. Uh, a woodwork, you saw some of the woodwork on that table. Mother of Pearl, yes, lots of that there. And jewelry. Same kind of jewelry, lapis, turquoise, lots of gold, lots of silver. But here, rather than getting your name in Hebrew, you can get it written in a hieroglyphic. And a lot of people like that. Um, when pharaohs wrote their names, they put them in ovals called cartouches. This is a cartouche, and this spells some guy's name, and this spells some guy's name. I don't know who they are. I don't read uh, hieroglyphics. But it is, in, it is symbolic that when you see the oval, it's someone's name. So they've taken that now to the modern era, and you can have your name in a cartouche and worn as a necklace or a, a pendant. It, now, some of them are cut out like this, where you can actually see through them. Some of them have solid backs, but darkening. Some of them are like this, where they're polished and added. I mean, it's a jewelry store, okay? There's going to be a bazillion chances. And you will tell them your name, and you will they will probably deliver it to your hotel the next day or that evening. Uh, it'll give their people time to get them together. And, uh, and you know, you know, they've got all these birds made up by the millions. They've got all these made up by the millions. All they have to do is meld them into the place there and uh, make the cartouche out of it. So that's a kind of a cool Egyptian uh, souvenir to pick up would be that. Also papyrus. Now, you know, Egyptian and papyrus, they are hand in hand. That's the home of papyrus. Um, you can buy ancient papyrus if you got six, seven thousand dollars. I can get you a piece of ancient papyrus and uh, that is, you know, thousands of years old if you want to spend the money. But most of us want a souvenir. And so they take the old process of making papyrus. There are people there who still hand mash and hand weave papyrus. They get very slave labor like thing, but anyway, they, they make the papyrus. And then they have artisans who paint the papyrus. So you have an actual piece of legitimate Egyptian papyrus, although it's modern, with modern painting on it. All kinds of different Egyptian scenes that have been taken out of tombs and been taken off of the walls of temples and stuff, and they will recreate them. And some of them are quite big, some of them 16 by 20 inches, if you want to pay that for a, a wall somewhere. But they do have them down to the five by seven size too. And I have two or three of those in my office. The, uh, one of King Tut's uh, tomb, uh, mask, his head, mask, that's very famous. And I have one of the earliest written record of the old, of the old sorry, the Ten Commandments of the Old Testament uh, was found in Cairo in the basement of a old synagogue there and really dates from almost the time of Christ. Uh, but it's the old it's uh, the Ten Commandments in, uh, in ancient Hebrew or ancient um, Egyptian on papyrus. Sorry, got tongue tied there. Um, replicas. Buying authentic Egyptian antiques is easier in the States than it is in Egypt because of the laws. Israel is one of the few countries in the world that makes buying legitimate antiquities easy. It's against the law to dig it up and go sell it. It's against the law. So if a looter were to dig it up and take it to a store, he could be arrested anywhere in between and spend prison time because he's looted something that's not his, it is the state of Israel's, and he could be arrested before he sells it to the store. But once he sells it to the store, which is a licensed antiquities dealer, then it becomes fair game, becomes fair market in, uh, value. And so it's a slippery slope 
of, of marketing, but Israel seems to live quite well with it. And buying real honest goodness antiquities in Israel is very simple and very legal. Egypt actually outlawed the selling of antiquities about 20 years ago. However, I know that there are about 16 or 17 stores in Egypt that have special agreements with the government that sell excesses from museums and from archaeologists. If they have 20 bowls, they don't need all 20 bowls. They keep 10, they sell 10. And they help to fund their archaeological work. So there are places to buy legitimate antiques. And I can help hook you up if you want to really buy uh, uh, something that is very Egyptian, like a scarab that was buried in a tomb somewhere. Or if you want to buy a piece of uh, mummy wrapping, you know, of the linen or something like that, it's available and we can find that. But for the most part, most of the things that you buy in Egypt are going to be replicas. They're not going to be the real thing. Again, if you want to buy widow's mites in Israel, the little widow's mite is a very, very small coin, just about the size of a fingernail. Uh, we, can set, we can get you widow's mites. They're going to be about $10 a piece, 10, 15 bucks a piece. But we can get you replicas and get you like, they look real, they look aged, they look antique. If you just tell people these are replicas of the widow's mite, then we can get you probably a little sack of 25 of them for about 10 bucks. They look as real as can be. Uh, you'd have to be an expert to not know that it's not a replica. Well, most of the things that you buy in Egypt are going to be replicas, um, again, at the souvenir stores and stuff like that. But many of them are aged to look good. Many of them are kept nice and shiny to look like they were found. But uh, all kinds of Egyptian symbols and Egyptian folks, and some of them ancient, and they'll look very aged and very real when you look at them. Um, but, you know, we just call those Egyptian artifacts and replicas and their souvenirs. Ceramics. Israel, uh, Egypt is very famous for its crude but attractive ceramics. They do a lot of these called the, the Egyptian men series, where you get people who serve tea, people who serve coffee, uh, people who serve bread. They're sitting with a plaque on their uh, lap and selling bread and things like that. It's very Egyptian, very cute, very crude art. Uh, primitive is the word I'm looking for, primitive art. And uh, very collectible, and very nice, and very inexpensive. Cloth in Egypt is very big. The Egyptian tops, dresses, jalabas, which are the what we call caftans, uh, robes and veils, lots of that kind of stuff is available everywhere. Beautiful silks and satins and cottons and some that are uh, um, microfiber now. They're using microfiber uh, for the comfort of it and washability of it, men's. Jalabas of guys, if you want to look a little Egyptian when you're laying around the house watching Law and Order, uh, it's certainly available to you. And uh, a lot of people buy the, the cotton ones for swim, swimming pool cover-ups and stuff like that. So those kind of things are very, very popular. Embroidery. They're known a lot for their applique work in embroidery. You'll see whole shops with embroidery and applique in the brightest of Egyptian colors. And very attractive uh, stuff. Very pretty. They'll make everything from a small uh, pot holder to a pillow cover to a wall hanging to a wall cover. So uh, you'll see a lot of that there. And it's all, you know, this hand work. It's not being done uh, by a laser machine in the back. Uh, this is hand work in Egyptian trades. Almost last, perfumes. We think of French perfumes, but the French learned their perfumes from the Egyptians when they ruled uh, ancient Egypt. It really started as an Egyptian craft. And you can, we will, we will walk by many perfumeries in Egypt. And they use the base types of uh, spices and incenses for their smells and combinations and stuff. And uh, it's very earthy and very light and very sweet and uh, Lots of choices and that sort of thing. If you want to take back what in the States would be incredibly expensive to have an Egyptian perfume, um, there you can get it for not much of anything, just not much at all. Kud powder. Kud powder is what you and I call incense. Uh, and they are famous for their incense, frankincense and myrrhs and all those things came through the spice trades. And um, 
the spice trades ran right through Israel. We'll go buy some uh, places that were actually on the spice trade, uh, ancient, and I'm talking 3000 BC, 2000 BC fortresses and forts, that the ruins are still there that uh, protected the spice traders as they came from the Orient and to the Orient and back in India. But it's still a very big trade there to deal in incense and spices. And these are two or three spice shops that are just all together in the old marketplace. So if you want to get some beautiful, you know, if you buy essential oils here in the States, you might as well buy some of the original stuff, which is good powder, which is the incense powder there. That's it. That's what I've got. I know that that's been maybe longer than what you wanted it to be, but yeah, I tried to cover everything in kind of one thing. When it comes to bartering in Israel, the one thing that I can tell you is some stores are going to be barter worth and some are not. Some are going to be very westernized and, you know, you just can't go to a grocery store and barter. Prices are fixed. But when we go into some place, I'll say, this is a barter place. Okay, this is a place. And for the most part, you can pretty much guarantee that if something is being sold for, say, $10, that you should be able to get it for Six six fifty something like that. You should be able to knock about thirty, maybe forty percent off of the price. Now that can take hours to get. It can take you leaving the store and coming back and reoffering and stuff. If you have, to, you know, if we have time to do that, great. But I will tell you that that you can almost always get twenty five percent off while you're there, while you're just dealing. And if they say, "Oh, I can let you have this for this," then the best thing to say is. That's a very good price. I appreciate that. But it's not worth it to me. To me, it's worth $6. And uh, if they say, well, but $10 is a very good price, you say, I understand. I, it's a wonderful piece of, of jewelry. But really, you know, I'm, uh, it, it's worth $6 to me. That's what it is worth to me. And if they'll, if you can get them down to seven or eight, then you've done well, you know? Um, and that usually doesn't take long, doesn't take hours of haggling. It usually takes a few minutes. Now, my feeling is if they offer it to me 10 and it's worth $8 to me when they reach eight, I quit. Could I have gotten it for six? Possibly. Yes, I possibly could have. I possibly could have gotten them down another buck or two. But when they reach a level where I say that's worth that to me, to me, it's worth an $8 investment to take to my cousin as a gift. Or it's worth eight bucks for me to take it home and I may use it or I may not use it. And I may use it as a Christmas gift or something like that. It's worth two bucks to me and that's what it's worth. Then I, I, the only time I go above what it's worth to me is if I really start to think about it and say, well, it's worth two bucks for me, but my cousin's worth three, so I'll do three, okay? Um, I don't go up. I don't go up. And if they won't come down, then I look for it somewhere else and see if I can get it. Because if it was too much for me, I don't have buyer's remorse later. I just say, it was worth that to me. Now, if you're not a barter and you want to take the legitimate price, don't go to Israel, okay? You will offend many of the Arabs if you don't. And they're going to just look at you as a real sucker. And they're going to think you're really stupid. Think very little of you. And if you go from one part of the store to the other, they may not wait on you. I mean, you may have cash out and say, I'd like to buy this over here, and they're just going to be busy because you kind of offended them. So barter a little bit if we say this is a bartering place. And if they reach your price and you're happy with it, stop bartering. Um, I bought one of the most important pieces I've ever purchased historically is I have a little rolling seal. It's a little seal and it's a cylinder, and you roll it in clay to imprint what's been carved on the outside. It's Assyrian. It is from the 586 Babylonian conquest of Israel by the Assyrians. It is an official seal of one of the livestock and agriculture ministers of Assyria. And it's from his palace or home in the West Bank, which is Shechem. We know that the, the Assyrians had a palace in Shechem. We found it. And this seal comes from that and says on the seal that it is a minister of livestock and agriculture. That's a very important piece. 
very historical piece, and it's one of the one of the more costly and important pieces that I have. It took me three hours to purchase, three hours to get him to come down to what I thought was a fair price. He started twice as high as I was ready to go. And I have to admit, in the open market, that's probably fair. It is probably that historically important. And he would get that price uh, in Europe or the United States if he advertised that piece. But it wasn't worth it to me. I, I don't have that kind of income to just say, oh, ooh, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to buy the Eiffel Tower because I like it. I can't do that. And I couldn't do that with this seal either. Did I love it? Yes, I loved it. But I had a price in mind. I walked out of the store three times thinking, this is it. It's over. I was not playing with him. I was not being dramatic. I walked out of the store, got down the sidewalk, and he called me back. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Come back. Come back. Let's talk. Let's talk. We're not so talking. What are you walking for? Come on. You act like you're angry. I'm not angry. I'm just I'm paying that price. Well, come on back. Let's talk. Let's talk. So we sat down. We had a cup of tea together. We drank tea. We, yeah, it came down more. And I, I said, I appreciate it. But I've tried to be honest with you. I am not trying to dicker with you. I'll tell you, first of all, I think that that is worth that money. I don't have that much money. I'm not made of money. I don't, I don't have a lifestyle where I can spend that kind of money on an artifact. It's a beautiful artifact. I am a pastor of a church. It would be very important for me to have a historical artifact like that. But I just don't make that kind of money. And I can spend it on just something that's going to sit on a shelf. So I hope you understand that I'm not trying to offend you. And I'm not saying that you're overcharging. I just can't. Left. Came back. Left. Came back. And finally, out of desperation, I think he had not made a lot of sales in a lot of days. And I was offering cash, not a credit card where he'd have to offer extra charge and stuff. And, uh, and I had literally gone to the bank that morning and cashed a check for cash in case I could find something in that range that I wanted. And he took it. He took my cash offer. And so I'm the very, very proud owner of, of an Assyrian seal from the conquest of 586 BCE um, of, of, Jerusalem, of Israel. But it took me like three hours to do. We're not going to have that kind of time. We're just not going to have that time. I will say that if you find something you really like and we're in Jerusalem for three or four days, I'll take you back to that store and we can dicker some more. If you find something you really, really want that's not in your price range yet, and we can try. We can try. I'll try with you. I'll work with you. And we'll see if we can't get them down a little bit more and do that. If we have the time, we'll do it. Okay? But with all that we're doing on tour and stuff like that, I, I realize this is not a shopping extravaganza for anyone. But once you get there, you'll be tempted and want to buy some things. And you're going to want souvenirs. And so I'm going to try and make myself available to do that. Okay? That's all I'm trying to say. I'm going to try and help you do that. And again, uh, you can do it with confidence, knowing that I'm not going to get anything back from it. I'm not going to take a dime from anyone. There are guides who make quite a bit of money on these kickbacks. There are, you know, I mean, there are pastors that come back with some cash in their wallet to pay for their next trip from all of the stores that are so grateful that you brought your tour group with you. Oh, you brought your group and they're going to make hundreds of dollars on the tour group and they're going to slip them some money as they go out the door. Carol and I did accept one gift one year. And it was from, but it was only after the third time we'd been with this guy and our tour group was gone and everything was over. And he said, you are friends, friends. I don't want to give this to you because you bring your group. And he gave us a, a wood burning of the Wailing Wall. It was on wood and an artist had actually done a wood burning. We were very proud to have it. We took it as a gift from him, not as a kickback for bringing people in. Um, but we're just not that kind of folks. We're not kind of folks. Um, usually tour directors get their pay, their trips for free. Um, we're not going to do that. I'm, I'm doing all this work and everything and we're paying for our own trip because we love it. We love Israel and we love God's people going to Israel. We want to make it as possible. Um, the 20 that we had, the group of 20 would get me a free trip without it costing you guys anything. Usually free trips are distributed among the people. Uh, my price would be distributed among you. We've never done that. We've always paid our own way, or we've reached what they call a cap, a cap where they say, okay, we're going to give you our free trip, but not charge the people. It's coming from the tour company. 
And so that's why we had a cap of 20. If we got 20 people, then I would be being paid for this work, basically, for the free trip. But that's not why we do it. So we did. We love to be there. And Carol and I would be going and paying the money anyway. You might as well come along with us. We'd love to have you. We're so glad to, I'm so excited to meet some of you that we've talked over the emails and stuff. And I'm really looking forward to getting to meet you. But uh, uh, we're going side by side with you. We're paying the same tips and the same everything that you are. So let's just go have a ball. Let's have a ball. The next meeting that we have will be on what to expect on a day-to-day trip. What are the terms that archaeologists use that tour guides are going to act like you know what they are, but most tourists don't? I know that all the tours we could do, we spend more time after the trip explaining what the guide said. Okay, when when he or she said this, this is what they mean. And people go, well, I really enjoyed it, but what did they mean by this? I was I got lost when they started talking about this. Well, now I prepare my troops ahead of time. I get you ready ahead of time. So when those terms are used, it rings a bell in your memory. You go, oh, okay, that's what I mean. Okay, so we'll be talking about some of those terms that will be kicked around by the guides. Um, some of them are biblical. Some of them are historical. Some of them are cultural. So not everybody knows all of them. You're going to be learning something new in the next trip, no matter what, in the next meeting. And um, uh, we'll just leave it open. I mean, if people want to come to Enid and do the meeting, if those of you that are in Ponca City and Oklahoma City and Tulsa area, if you want to come over and have a live meeting, I'm for that. If you want to do it this way, Zoom and record, I mean, just record it. Zoom was not going to work for us because my laptop and camera in the sound booth that I couldn't switch back and forth like we've been doing here. Uh, doing it at the house makes it quite easy to Zoom. But I can record at the church, and then we can splice the stuff in just as easily. So we'll talk about that in the spring, whether or not we want to have a live meeting for the close-up close, close up people. Or if you just rather watch the recording at home. It makes no difference to me. I just want you to be ready and informed when you show up. Okay? All right. That's all I got. So send me your questions. Send me anything you've got. And I'll type them out on a uh, Microsoft document and then send them out to everybody with the answers. Has a handout flyer. And don't forget, check your emails now. Okay, check your emails because I'm going to be sending you the handout documents to go through this and make notes if you want to. All right. God bless y'all. See ya.